Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. The relations between South Korea, Japan, and the United States are often described as triangular. The two Asian countries have been longtime alliance partners of America and all share common interests, such as the denuclearization of North Korea. Yet, this Northeast Asian triangle is facing an uncertain future. And while it has to adapt to the rise of China, America debates its role in the region, and South Korea and Japan keep clashing over historical disputes. To learn more about these challenges and the relationship between the three countries, we had the pleasure of interviewing Jonathan Pollack. He spoke to us about the paradoxical realities of East Asia's international relations, South Korea's and Japan's different perceptions and agendas, and about the implications of these issues for the United States and its presence in the region. Jonathan Pollack is the Interim SK Korea Foundation Chair in Korea Studies in the Center for East Asia Policy Studies and a Senior Fellow in the John L. Thornton China Center at the Brookings Institution. Previously, he was a professor at the U.S. Naval War College and worked for the RAND Corporation. Jonathan Pollack has written numerous articles and books on East Asia's international relations and received his MA, as well as his PhD in political science, from the University of Michigan. Dr. Pollack, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. You have done research and written about East Asia's international relations for several decades. What got you initially interested in the region and its politics? Uh, that's a very good question. I, I, actually, my interests specific to China go back to the Vietnam War because many American officials said that we weren't really fighting Vietnamese in Vietnam, we were fighting Chinese. I thought that that was kind of an odd notion, but China was very closed then. No Americans traveled there. It was utterly isolated from the outside world, and it was an enormous challenge to understand it. My interest in Korea came a little later, but I would say that my overall approach has always been to look at the region very much in a regional context. Don't look at only one actor or another actor. You have to fit together all the pieces. And that's become more and more pronounced, I believe, over the decades as these states, even including states that are very, very close to the United States, consider their own options and alternatives and their own long-term policy goals. A recent working paper you wrote for the Brookings Institutes was entitled Order at Risk, Japan, Korea, and the Northeast Asian Paradox. What is that Northeast Asian Paradox? I took that phrase from an early speech that Park yun uh, the president of the Republic of Korea, even before she was the president, she had argued that there is this fundamental either paradox or contradiction between the reality that Northeast Asia as a region setting aside North Korea as a very special case, but that the region as a whole is increasingly integrated economically, socially, in some measure culturally, yet it lacks any kind of binding, deeper multilateral arrangements, and more to the point, even with all this interaction and with presumably a shared stake in prosperity and stability, there are underlying competitive urges on the part of all actors in Northeast Asia, which leave you with a sense that which way will the region go? Will it go towards more in the way of integration, cooperation, and peace? Or alternatively, because of the sheer amount of power that exists in Northeast Asia, will it go in a very, very contrary direction? That was really the question she asked, and it seemed a good way to frame the questions that I wanted to address. One could expect that both Japanese and South Korean agendas would be quite similar. After all, they have a common ally in the United States, a common foe in North Korea, and face the rise of regional giant China. Yet in practice, their agenda seems quite different. Why is that? Maybe that's the ultimate paradox of Northeast Asia, if you think about it, that Korea and Japan have a very, very complex historical relationship, um, more to the point their perceptions of their interests and their long-term strategic goals vary very considerably. So even though nominally both are close to the United States, both represent important alliance relationships with the United States, the United States has always, in essence, treated these alliances as very, very different, very, very distinct. So that, in a lot of ways, 
undermines what the United States would probably wish to see in terms of of relations in Northeast Asia, yet it reflects the fundamental facts. Obviously, uh, Korea was a colony of Japan. It was a very, very uh, brutal kind of record. And in many, many ways, uh, the Japanese have not fully acknowledged much of what went on in that era. And this, of course, is something that is resented very, very much by the Koreans, both in North and in South. So you have this sense of how history hovers over both of these societies, both of these systems, and certainly both of these leaders without any kind of resolution. So issues emerge at different times, issues related to the treatment of uh, Korean women who were forced into prostitution during the war, for example, Japan's overall record in Korea as a colonial power, questions in the minds of Koreans whether Japan will treat Korea in a way that Korea deems appropriate and respectful. Contrarily, the Japanese often weary of their relations with South Korea. Again, despite their closeness, despite the essential similarity of their systems, in Japan they often talk of Korea fatigue, a belief that uh, South Korea will never let go of all these animosities and will try to extract gains of one sort or another repeatedly from Japan. So it makes it very, very different. The other factor, of course, is simply that these two leaders in these two countries are making very different strategic choices about China and relations with China. Japan has always concerned itself with if China were ever to become truly much more powerful, economically powerful, militarily powerful, and so forth, what did this imply for Japan? And under uh, Shinzo Abe, the current prime minister, he has articulated a view of China that is much darker than many of his, his predecessors, in essence, believing that the biggest long-term danger to Japan's interests would, in fact, be China. That's not the calculation that's being made in Korea. Korea sees itself, obviously, geographically closer to China. And of course, they have a common problem with respect to North Korea. So for these reasons and a host of other reasons, and frankly, the extent to which South Korea and China have shared animosities towards Japan, uh, there was a basis and continues to be a basis on which Korea orients itself towards China in a very, very different way than does Japan. Expanding on this, in your paper you quote Yoshide Soeya of KU University, who explains that all regional states are, and I quote, struggling to find an optimal strategy in the context of a shifting power balance between the United States and China. How did that manifest? This is the undercurrent of so much of the discussion about China. I mean, there's a fair question to ask as to whether or not this region will be so fundamentally dominated by the realities of U.S.-China relations, or whether there are concepts indigenous to the region that might, in essence, prove much more viable over the longer run. But every country in East Asia, not just in Northeast Asia, but in Southeast Asia and beyond, is asking itself questions not only about how China exercises its power, but more specifically, what is the character of the U.S.-China relationship? For some, and maybe for many, even if, for example, if you could imagine a situation where the United States and China would look much too close, if you will, a G2, that might trigger as much animosity or as much anxiety, rather, among the states of the region as one if they were really at loggerheads in a variety of ways. But no one has an interest in seeing this relationship become overtly conflictful, confrontational, but the reality of having the world's two biggest powers having conflicting interests and some collaborative interests in the neighborhood is something that every leader across Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and to some extent in Central and South Asia as well, thinks about every day. If they don't, they're not doing their jobs. How do the two countries, Japan and South Korea, perceive the other's relation and alliance to the United States? I think both feel separately that they are the essential, the critical partner of the United States. It doesn't make them overtly in competition with one another, but the reality is that the United States deploys significant military forces in 
both countries, but that the purposes of these forces are very, very different. In the Japanese case, it's much more oriented towards facilitating U.S. roles and missions that go beyond East Asia, because after all, Japan still labors under constitutional constraints that really don't enable it to be a true security collaborator with the United States. By contrast, Korea is a security collaborator with the United States every day because you have an armistice, not a peace. There are acute threats to the peace in Korea that are there. And in a way, it makes Korea a much more essential ally of the United States, but its interests are more local, configured predominantly to the Korean Peninsula, whereas the Japanese try to make a case that their involvement with the United States goes beyond simply Japan, particularly under circumstances where there seems to be more flexibility because of constitutional reinterpretation in Japan. Abe has goals that will make Japan much more a true ally of the United States. Whether he can achieve that or not is a different thing, but in some sense, the only time that both of these countries think about one another is when you think about North Korea, because you could argue there that's a basis for a common perception of threat. But uh, my own view is that even there, South Korea lives with this every day. It's the reality of a divided peninsula, of a highly adversarial relationship with the North. Now, North Korea has a very poor relationship with Japan as well, but it doesn't have that same immediacy. Uh, So I think both powers are seeking signs of affirmation that the United States really, really matters in ways that will reassure them about their fundamental national security. So in that sense, I'm not sure even if they get into some kind of specific competition with one another, but each tries to make a case on its own terms why their concept of a bilateral relationship with the United States is truly what matters. You just mentioned North Korea. Do Japan and South Korea perceive North Korea in the same way? Are they pursuing similar outcomes, or do we see discrepancies between the two? I think there are significant discrepancies between the two, some of it in terms of the dynamics of their bilateral relationship with North Korea, what one or the other side has sought in different periods of time, but at the same time, the ultimate outcomes. South Korea, at least older generations of South Korea, including President Park, still believe very keenly in the idea of Korean unification. Whether that's more fanciful and really won't be achieved is a fair question. But I think that for Japan, North Korea, there have been animosities because of the abduction of Japanese citizens decades ago. That actually helped launch the career of Prime Minister Abe. But I think that the North has never had quite the same immediacy to Japan that it does to South Korea, simply because For the South and the North, it's a divided peninsula. They were enemies in war. Uh, They have a contentious history going back to their very origins as independent states. Whereas for Japan, I would say, and I wouldn't want this to be misconstrued, often North Korea has been more an annoyance, but it's been used as a basis to mobilize public sentiment in Japan. And even perhaps sometimes I think the Japanese under some prime ministers have believed that if Japan could achieve a more normal relationship with North Korea, Japan might find that a very, very useful counter in the larger geopolitical competition with China. We're not at that point. The reason we're not at that point is because North Korean behavior has been so profoundly objectionable to both leaders recently and that both have to contemplate the consequences of the advancement of a nuclear and missile program that could be directed at one or the other. So to some extent, they have that as a common link. But beyond that, I'm not sure that the links run so deep. You know, for all of us, for all countries, the question of North Korea, its sustainability, its goals, the risks that it poses to the region, including to China, are self-evident. It's isolated still, but it has all this grandiosity, or its leader has all this grandiosity. Nobody really knows what the ultimate outcome would be, whether it would be possible to imagine ever 
a normal relationship between North Korea and the outside world? That's a very big question, and I think that there's a lot of skepticism that under the prevailing regime, you'd actually get there. Maybe the more interesting question would be, if for sake of argument, you presume that ultimately there is Korean unification, how would the Japanese in particular perceive that? There's an old argument that the ones who really worry the most about Korean unification would be China, because the presumption would be that China would then have a unified democratic Korea aligned or allied with the United States, maybe even in a worst case scenario with American forces north of the 38th parallel, at least in some of the thinking, uh, that worst case thinking that's offered. But frankly, as in my own interactions with Chinese, I would say that there is a basis on which many in China believe that if there were moves towards unification, even though there's nothing that looks to be in that direction right now, there's no inherent reason why this would necessarily make a unified Korea an adversary of China. A unified Korea would have very, very substantial reasons of its own to interact with China because for better or for worse, you would be stuck with them. They would be your neighbor with a common 1400 kilometer border those realities don't change. There's a lot of commonalities in the development strategies between China and South Korea, which under conditions of unification, it would seem to me, would be that much more enforced. So if you think of it this way, if South Korea sees itself as a bridge to China, that's on the mainland of Asia, whereas Japan sees itself more as at least under prevailing circumstances, a Pacific power that is tied integrally to the United States. Whereas um, if Korea were to unify it, or even if it does not, there are reasons that tend to link China to South Korea, at least, that just don't find the same parallel in relations between China and Japan. How do the difference we've just talked about fit with the U.S. current alliances with Japan and South Korea? Are the two countries satisfied with the current arrangements, or should we expect new bargains to be struck to adapt to the evolution of the region? I think that both Korea and Japan, but for different reasons, are seeking a different definition of the alliance bargain with the United States. Neither one of them wish to contemplate a future where they do not have the alliance with the United States, but both in different ways are seeking more freedom of action a measure of increased autonomy of one kind or another that will enable them to realize national goals that go beyond just simply the continuing alliance with the United States. They don't want to contemplate a future where there is not that link to the United States. But beyond that, I think that their views of this alliance with the U.S., are really quite different. In the case of Korea, they want to absolutely ensure that the United States is unambiguously linked to the South's security goals and interests, that it will not undertake a some kind of an, an illicit deal with the North. I don't see any reason to believe that we would, but that we will, in other words, fundamentally respect and ensure South Korea's strategic equities. Japan feels the same, but Japan comes at it in a different way simply because the alliance between the United States and Japan is so different in its practical realities, the purposes that are served by the alliance with Japan for the United States. The United States relies on bases, facilities, different forms of cooperation with Japan, but the Japan-America alliance is not akin to a NATO-like alliance, even though the Japanese under Abe are now insisting they want to move more in those directions. Whether Japan would really want to be that tightly bound to the United States, I think is an open question. But they want, in effect, a green light from the United States to begin to pursue interests of their own that give them more running room, more breathing room, enable them to play a larger role. But it doesn't necessarily translate, I believe, into Japan being eager to get involved in fighting with the United States in some of America's wars. Whereas Korea, the reality is, is you are there in a wartime environment directly. Korea, of course, 
played a not insignificant role during U.S. involvement in Vietnam. It's played a role in America's Middle Eastern wars. Japan had a marginal role in that, but it, nothing related to actual combat. So that's the, one of the fundamental differences. Korea is involved in a way that entails combat relationships with the United States. Japan is not, at least not now, and that's a fundamental difference. So you have to ask, how does the United States value one or the other relationship under prevailing or foreseeable international circumstances? And how do they actually perceive the situation? And what are the objectives that the U.S. is pursuing in the region? You know, a lot of people think that there's always a grand strategic design that underlies what the United States does. But I think often the concerns of an alliance are much more almost practical in a way. You want to ensure that you have effective cooperation and communication because you operate physically from the territory of Japan and Korea. If, you know, for example, those are really the only countries in East Asia where the United States has a meaningful on-the-ground involvement and presence of U.S. forces. If you think more broadly, you see some periodic rotations of U.S. forces in Australia, for example, but that's, that's, that's essentially different. So the United States needs to ensure that, A, neither Japan nor South Korea will undertake actions that suggest major divergence from U.S. policy goals. And at the same time, they want them to be reliable partners who will facilitate needs that the United States has in both domains. But in the Korean case, this is configured very, very heavily to the threat from the North. Japan's is somewhat more, we might say, elastic, although often the U.S. may not say this, but I think a lot of it has implications for relations with China simply because Japan does not want to face a situation where it believes the U.S. is, in a way, pulling away from Japan as China becomes stronger. I don't hear that same concern being voiced in Korea. And part of that is because it's the sheer ongoing existence of a North Korean threat. If you didn't face that kind of a threat, there would have to be some very, very big questions asked about what would the purposes of the alliance be under alternative circumstances. Might it be the case that over in a long run sense, the wariness towards China could extend to South Korea, not so much not wishing to have decent relations with China, but something of a hedge in the event that some aspects of China ROK relations were under question. But under prevailing circumstances, everything that South Korea is trying to do militarily is to build up its own power, but to direct it against the perceived threats from the North, leaving open questions of over the longer run what would be a strategic design for South Korea or for a unified Korea? How much would it go into the maritime domain, for example? How serious would South Korea be as a major middle power? Ultimately, what is at stake in Northeast Asia? I think that the United States recognizes that Northeast Asia, this very concentrated location of enormous economic military power, including nuclear weapons, is a vital American interest. What we don't have in Northeast Asia, and I think will be very, very difficult to realize under prevailing circumstances, is some kind of an integrated uh, strategic concept that combines both of these U.S. allies, or even more, finds them in closer interaction with China as well. But the U.S. looks at this region and says that it is the most dynamic economic environment in the world. You have China now as the number two economic power in the world, soon to be number one. Japan is number three and will probably stay in that condition for some time. South Korea is either number 11 or number 12. If Korea were ever unified, it would be an enormous potent force of its own. So the combination of all of these things and the fact that the United States fought a war here and finds itself integrally drawn to ongoing relationships with both of these countries, but now with China as this additional separate but enormous factor in this equation, it is less why does this region 
matter, but more, how it, could it not matter? I mean, it may be the underlying premise of um, President Obama's efforts to think about a reconfiguration of American interests, less from Europe and, of course, not less consumed by the conflicts in the Middle East and towards East Asia, although I would argue that, frankly, the rebalance had very little to do with Northeast Asia. These are long-term American commitments that the U.S. had undertaken, going back, of course, to Americans' involvement in defining the institutions of regional order at the end of the Second World War. So it has become so inherent in the way the United States thinks about its political role, its security role, and so forth. More to the point, South Korea, unlike its past, is now a vibrant, contentious democracy. Both countries obviously are enormously important trade partners of the United States. Significant numbers of Korean Americans now live in the United States and are citizens in the United States. So if you look at the longer term of societies that are, although Japan may be slowing because it's aging rapidly, to some extent South Korea is aging too, but not quite the same rate, But these are just enormously important as close allies that depend on the United States over a long distance because absent these relationships, the basis for the United States sustaining a significant military presence in the West Pacific would diminish very, very sharply. So the U.S. bears that in mind, but it also recognizes that dynamic societies in terms of technological development, industrial products and the like, how could you not want to be there? More to the point, the United States has to be mindful that it does not wish to see renewed military conflict here because the consequences of that for war in the domain of where you major industrial actors and the like would be unimaginable and would have global consequences. So to the U.S., this looks like something that the U.S. is committed to over the longer run. The question is whether these relationships can be reshaped over time in a way that will still address American security concerns, but will also be mindful of the interests and the goals and, frankly, the fears of both Korea and Japan. Dr. Pollack, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. 